Hello, everybody. I'm SEAC retired John Wayne Troxell, and welcome to the kickoff for the 2022 season of Leader Talk. I think you know this show we get after the art of leadership and influence, and we've had such great uh, guests on this show, like uh, the 19th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Marine General Joe Dunford, from former Supreme Allied Commander Europe, uh, Army retired General Mike Scaparotti, and today is no different. Uh, today, we have one of the most influential people in the United States as our guest today. Our guest uh, is an Army Reserve officer, first and foremost, um, if I can be a little biased. She's a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves, uh, but she was a sitting congressman for the U.S. representative for the Hawaii 2nd Congressional District. Um, and she was the first Hindu member of Congress and also the first Samoan American voting member of Congress. She was a candidate for the Democratic nomination in the 2020 United States presidential election. And most importantly, she is a combat veteran uh, of war's Operation Iraqi Freedom. So uh, I wanna welcome in our guest today, Mrs. Tulsi Gabbard. Ma'am, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, John, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, I think somebody's gonna turn the video on in a second. Uh, thank you so much for having me here as a guest on your program. Uh, I feel honored to join um, the ranks of the guests that you've had on and uh, <laughs> you and I have not met in person yet. So, I mean, given this day and age, I feel like this is the best we can do, right? It's good to see you. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we had a pretty good conversation and um, it was, uh, it was really good. So there, there we you are. are. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for being here. I know how busy your schedule is and how much you're trekking from the island uh, back to the States and back and forth. So, it's an honor to have you here today. So first of all, how are you doing and how is your family? I'm great, thanks for asking. I uh, started out this morning uh, with some uh, fellow uh, military friends and uh, we went and hiked up a mountain and it was great. <laughs> so I got in awesome. my good PC this morning. It's always a, a great way to start the day, but um, you know, my family's healthy, everyone is safe and I am grateful to uh, to live in this this beautiful place. I, I do travel a lot, but it's always uh, really nice to come home here. Absolutely. And you know, you know, so I, you like, I'm sure are like me that on some days, the, the only thing I really get accomplished is my PT in the morning. So, uh, and it makes all the difference though, right, John? I mean, I, I, um, I was down for the count. I had, you know, my, my back got a little tweaked a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, I took it easy and I'm like, okay, the, like the best I can do is go and walk, but come on. <laughs> um, it, 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 nothing wrong with walking, but I, yeah. I require uh, a lot. I, I, I like more high intensity stuff. I do yoga, uh, but just the effect that it has obviously on physical health, but mental health as well. It's, it's kind of the one thing, it's that time of the day where I completely turn off anything related to news and politics and anything else and uh, just focus on maximizing my physical performance and uh, it's necessary. It makes all the difference. Absolutely. Well, again, we, we uh, are so grateful to have you on here today. And, you know, I, I'd like to ask you a few questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to our audience, you know, sure. because a lot of, of folks uh, are big fans of yours and. Um, we were hoping for a different outcome in 2020, you know, for the uh, uh, Democratic nomination. We won't go into that, though, but uh, you're here today. So I want to ask if you have a long and storied history of leading in multiple areas, you know, to include the military as an Army Reserve Lieutenant Colonel, a uh, sitting member of Congress and an advocate for others. I just like to know what, what do you believe are some key qualities a leader must possess to be most effective in influencing and inspiring those they lead and to achieve mission or task objectives in a timely and effective manner? Um, humility. You know, I, I think that the, um, in my own experience of leaders who I've been inspired by, as well as those who have inspired me through what I would call a poor example of leadership, um, you know, there's a clear difference between those who lead with humility and see themselves as servant leaders mm. versus 
those who uh, lack humility and the ability to be introspective and see themselves as leaders who uh, are given the power to dominate over others. Uh, I, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about, especially in the military, but in politics, in life, in whatever you know someone's job may be. Um, that to me is 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 one of the most clear differences that I've experienced in in those who are inspiring leaders, motivating leaders, those who inspire uh, their teams to give their all and to, and to give their best. Um, and frankly, those who are able to do the things you're talking about, uh, articulate and identify what exactly am I trying to accomplish? Um, you know, who will it impact? You know, will it impact those I'm serving positively or negatively? And then be able to come up with a strategy to effectively uh, accomplish that goal and objective. And, and I think, um, you know, again, I, I, I'm grateful to have had the experience both in the military as well as in civilian life and public office to um, see where this works and where it doesn't. And when you have leaders who are more concerned about themselves, their image, their legacy, uh, you know, their OER bullets, their NCOER bullets, like when, when that is your driving concern, um, your objective is yourself rather yeah. than accomplishing the mission, uh, taking care of those you are leading, serving the public if you're in public office, acting what is in the best interest of, of others rather than in your own selfish interest. I think to me, that's, that's the most important quality because um, all the other things to me can be taught and learned, but you can't teach someone how to not be selfish or how to care for others. That's something that only, that, that's choice, frankly, that, that each of us uh, and only us can make uh, within ourselves and it's and it's a daily frankly it's a daily choice yeah absolutely having said what you just said um, you know we as you described we live in a world where some leaders are more focused on being popular rather than effective exactly. and I think it goes back to some of the things you talked about you know the selfishness you know and that they lead for themselves and everything but you know we see things nowadays where leaders are trying to influence subordinates not by their example, but by doing things like virtue signaling, uh, genuflecting, or they just have this imbalance uh, of compassion and discipline. Mm -hmm. And whether it's being over compassionate or under, and under disciplined or vice versa, um, you have always been somebody that uh, is upfront. You've been genuine in your demeanor. Um, you've been transparent in your approach. And you, sometimes blunt, which, you know, the troops love blunt. I've known, for, I've known for that, trust me. <laughs> whether, um, whether at home or at work, I've known for that. <laughs> yeah. So, but, so in your opinion, how important is it for a leader to be transparent, you know, and not try to put up any smoke and mirrors or, or try to do things that will, you know, make them popular, but, you know, not necessarily make them efficient or effective as a leader? To me, it makes that the difference between that is, is are you going to go for the short term gratification or are you going for something that is real and, and lasting, frankly? So, you know, I could sit here in front of you and, and say, okay, what, 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 what do I got to say to make John think I'm awesome, right? <laughs> but then yeah. maybe I say one thing to you right now, John. And tomorrow you, you know, you, you go online and you see me making a video on Instagram that says the exact opposite thing. I might have made you happy today and make you think I'm great today and tomorrow and be like, what the heck? <laughs> who is this person? Right? Who who is she really? And and I yeah. think that that to me is the difference between uh, between leaders and followers. Uh, and I can say very directly, uh, especially in Congress, but again, this applies across the board in, in any leadership capacity. If you're playing to, to whatever that momentary kind of common denominator is uh, and putting your finger to the wind to virtue signal or to kind of like, hey, hey this thing is trending on Twitter. Let me, let me blast this tweet out so I can get a bunch of clicks. Uh, yeah. But then the wind direction changes tomorrow and you're like, oh crap, what am I gonna do now? Or like, what do I actually believe? Um, 
you know, those I, I've had people tell me over the years, regardless of their political affiliation, that uh, even though they disagree with some of my positions uh, politically, uh, they have supported me over the years because they trust that that I'm coming from a place of of wanting to be of service and and uh, coming from a place of of doing my best to act in the best interest of those I am serving, of the American people and for our country. So, you know, it allows us to say, okay, yeah, you know, maybe this approach is better or your approach is better or, or whatever the case may be. But if, if there's a lack of sincerity and integrity and authenticity and transparency, then really what are, what are you left with, right? You're left with somebody who's blowing in the wind. Uh, you're left with somebody who's constantly reacting rather than leading and having the foresight and vision to say, okay, hey, look, this is what's coming around the corner. Um, it may not be what you wanna hear, but this is the reality that we're dealing with. So we can deal with reality or you can go and sit and live in your fantasy world. Um, I, I, yeah. choose, I choose to live in reality. And, and again, just back to the beginning, to me, this is the difference between leaders and followers. And unfortunately too, Many people in leadership positions in our country, both in politics and in the military, are followers rather than leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, what's interesting about you is that, you know, you're a veteran, but you're still serving. You're a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. Yeah. Uh, but you were in the military, but you were also a sitting member of Congress and a, a uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination for president. I mean, that had to be tough. Just me looking at it from the outside, as you try to balance uh, the politics associated with office and presidential nomination, and then being that apolitical field grade officer that you were, yeah. that had to be tough. How did you kind of manage that um, as you, you went through, you know, uh, trying yeah. to, you know, and, and you were, quite frankly, you were successful. Um, you've always been successful at what you've been doing. And for the most part, you've been able to separate the two, but how hard was it? Uh, to be honest, it really was not and isn't hard. Uh, it, it wasn't while I was holding office and it's not hard now because I know very clearly the, the brick wall that stands between the two. When I'm in uniform, I'm in uniform and I'm fulfilling my responsibilities of my job and my rank and my chain of command uh, and, and the work that's before us. Uh, and I'm no different than any other soldier that I have the privilege of working with, period, yeah. full stop. Uh, when, I'm, when I was a member of Congress uh, and I'm fulfilling that role and responsibility uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee and, and so forth, um, you know, the, the responsibilities of those two roles are very different. And I never allowed one to get in the way of the other. And frankly, they complemented each other. Yeah. Uh, the experiences that I've had, and, and you know, I, for those who don't know, I've, I've served in the reserve component for uh, eight, next month makes my 19th year serving. And I've been in the reserve component all along. And I've always had these two, um, you know, a civilian life and, and a military life. And uh, through my time in Congress in particular, to be able to bring those experiences that I'd had first four years as an enlisted soldier and my first deployment as an E4, and yes. then uh, later going through OCS and, and being able to deploy a second time as a platoon leader, um, those experiences of what happens or the effects on those who are quote unquote boots on the ground or, or standing in those formations uh, mm -hmm. of the decisions that are being made in Congress uh, was really critical. And it allowed me to ask uh, different questions that others who, who don't have the privilege of that experience wouldn't know to ask. Um, I'll give you one example. There was a, a panel that was commissioned by Congress to examine a certain issue within the military. They went and they did this study and it was made up of both active and retired military uh, members. And when they came back before the Armed Services Committee to report their findings, uh, this, this was regarding sexual assault in the military, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they came back to report their findings, I looked at who was on the panel and I said, why don't you have any SAR majors or first sergeants here? Why is there no enlisted representation when the vast majority of those who are victims of or survivors of sexual assault, male or female in the military, are junior enlisted soldiers? Absolutely. 
So by, by only representing the commander's perspective, which is important, but it is not a holistic big picture at all, uh, they're doing a disservice to their outcome and, and to the service member. So, you know, it, it, it that's, that's one example of many, um, uh, not everyone will, will agree. Uh, I, I've had members, uh, caught former colleagues of mine saying that, hey, look, just because you wear the uniform uh, as a reserve soldier, uh, that creates a conflict of interest for you to make decisions uh, on the Armed Services Committee. And frankly, there's people in the Pentagon uh, who've tried to make it actually change policy to make it so people like me and others who are still serving in Congress are not allowed to be uh, also serving in the reserve component um, I'll, I'll let them make their arguments. I think it's crap. Uh, and I think there, there are probably some underlying fears there because I got to go and sit in those rooms and have those conversations on the Armed Services Committee. And then, oh, by the way, I got to go to my drill weekend and actually talk to real, real you know, soldiers who, who are like, hey, yeah, you know that thing, that requirement that they put in place? It's turned into a check the block PowerPoint, total freaking waste of time. So, um, having that real time feedback helped me, but sometimes some people don't like it. <laughs> yeah. So I just, what you just kind of talked about, I'd like to ask you just an off the cuff question. Yeah. It's the democratic nomination. You're on, you're on stage with the other candidates. Uh, what was that moment like for you? Um, you know, because a lot of us who have been fans of yours for years, we were so excited and, and then some of the things that you said up there had us all, you know, jumping in, in, you know, for joy and everything. But what was that like as you, you're standing up there and you've got all of these other candidates and your millions of people are watching you? What was that like? Um, not my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, predominantly because, John it's political theater, right? Mm. It, it, it's this situation where the goal should be to say, hey, here is all of these individuals who are offering to serve you, voter in America, as your president and commander in chief. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to compare and contrast how they stand, where they stand on different issues, how they would lead, what kind of judgment they would bring to the situation yes. room in that moment of crisis. But that's not, that's not what happens. And it's not what happens certainly in my experience where you, you end up really with political theater that exists to drive up the ratings of whatever TV channel is hosting it. And, uh, and a mechanism for the political party to pick and choose who they want people to hear from. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was, it was uh, you know, certainly my nerves. I remember just off stage, yeah, my nerves are going. I go through my prep. I'm ready to ready to talk about any one of all of the, the different issues. Um, never got uh, a, a you know on average, I probably got six minutes out of a two hour long debate to talk. But really, walking on the stage, I mean, it's it's just like um, I don't know how to compare it. But as soon as I walked on the stage, it's it's time to work, and there was zero thought about the uh, the thousands of people in the audience or or what people may think or or any of the other noise i was very focused on what i went there to say what i hope to communicate to those there and and the people at home and also just recognizing like all the people standing next to me um they are just people and hopefully hopefully they're all there um respecting the voter at home because you, uh, the American people, our servicemen and women, the people at home who are watching, like you, you're the most important person, not any single person on that stage. Yeah. Okay, the last question I have for you before we go to the audience. Um, you know, this just in, there's a lot going on in the world, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've had COVID, you know, for, you know, a couple of years here, you know, the unrest of 2020. Um, the January 6th, uh, you know, event, you know, our abrupt exit from Afghanistan, supply chain issues, inflation, Chinese malign activity in the South China Sea and in the Taiwan Strait. Now we got the war in Ukraine with Russia and everything. And then, but we have this 
political polarization in our company in our country and uh and it's very i mean you know you can't have a political conversation now you know and some families get torn apart because of this polarization you know you know you've been a presidential candidate member of congress you're a field grade officer in the army reserves what do you believe as a country we need to do to unite the citizens uh, in this country and in our Congress and to get after and right these economic issues and to continue to be able to defend our homeland, our freedoms and our interests at home and abroad? Sorry for the, the long question there, but- uh, uh, it, It's such an important one though, John. It's, it, is, it is the critical question um, that we should all be asking ourselves, what can I do? What can I do to be a part of the solution? How we come together as a country is not somebody else's problem. This is a challenge that sits before every one of us. And the central thing I think is um, we've got to get back to basics. Each of us as individuals, as well as how we hold our leaders accountable, get back to the basics. And what are those basics? It is the, our, our, our foundation as a country that is rooted in our constitution and bill of rights. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen interviews or I've, I've heard conversations or read articles about uh, a lot of people not even knowing what our bill of rights are. Right. A lot of people who, uh, yeah, they, they weren't taught, it wasn't, it wasn't driven home in schools, I think for, yeah. for almost an entire generation, right? So you've got kids who are going to college now or graduating from college who really believe that if you say something that offends me or that hurts my feelings, you should not have the right to say it. So, so if, if, if our, our freedom of speech in that way is so easily dismissed, um, not by one or two people, not by some fringe groups, but this is something that's happening constantly. Um, whether you're talking about individuals in this mindset or you're talking about uh, big tech, or you're talking about politicians, uh, basically going along with this new philosophy of like, you know what? Yeah, I believe in freedom of speech as long as I like what you're saying, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, yeah. it is such a dangerous yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, I think there's some folks in the world that um, they have a stereotype about others. And then when all of a sudden someone starts uh, negating that stereotype in the, in terms of that they've broadened themselves and, and they've crossed cultures and everything like this. Um, and that narrative starts to whittle that what I call a false narrative. Uh, some people not only get ugly about that, but some, in some cases they get violent about it because it's defeating what, you know, they try to come across as saying is, is what this world is like. So I appreciate your candor on that. I think I think um, when we go back to where that's rooted from, there's insecurities and there's fears and you know fear maybe that you may be proven wrong or fears that the things that you've held on to and believed for much of your life uh, may actually not uh, not be right or true or, or or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, so as as we look at what each of us can do. Yes, let's go back to the basics. Remember the vision that our founders had for our country. Celebrate and uphold these freedoms. And along with that, recognize that whether you're Democrat or Republican, conservative, progressive, independent, uh, you know, black, white, uh, Catholic, Hindu, like whatever, all of these different things that, that make each of us unique, um, treat each other with respect. Treat each other with the respect that, that we would like to see from others as fellow Americans and be willing to listen, to hear a different perspective. And sure, if, if you wanna get after it and debate because your idea is superior, awesome, awesome, because that's what America is about. It's bringing each of our ideas or views or opinions or positions to this public marketplace of ideas, whether it be in mm -hmm. person, line, in politics or in life, and be able to say, yeah, John, you and I agree on this, but man, like we are not on the same page on that, but I respect you, I respect you. And, and uh, let's focus on the things that, that we, we find in our common ground and make some progress 
there. We've got to come back to this identity of who we are as Americans. And this is what troubles me so much by people who are so willing to throw away our constitution, literally just trash it, especially people who have taken that oath to support and defend it, is if we're not coming around up around that basic foundation, then who are, like, what is our country about? Who are we? Absolutely. As we lose that identity and we lose what makes America that shining city on the hill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the diversity of our nation is the strength of our nation. And I think that's, you know, what has made us the greatest nation on the planet. So, and that strength comes from that foundation. We take away that yeah. foundation with, we, we don't have anything left. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go to our audience here. And the first one I'm going to go to is a guy named Scott Stalker. Scott is the sitting U.S. Space Command, Command Senior Enlisted Leader. He's a Marine, so I, I'm hoping that he didn't write his questions out in crayon. But uh, <laughs> um, Scott, we're going to go ahead and let you ask uh, Tulsi a question. Go ahead. Awesome. Hey, thanks, John. Hope you can hear me. Um, ma'am, great, great to see you, ma'am. Uh, many years ago, you came and visited uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and you I spoke remember. to us. I was the senior enlisted leader there. So thank you for that, first and foremost. Um, we've got my question, pictures somewhere. I've got, we've got a really great picture walking down the hall, by the way, from that day. I remember that. I, I saw that. It looked like you had a, a massive entourage. But uh, yes, ma'am, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> um, Two questions for you, and one ties into what you kind of were just talking about, and that is uh, this idea of information. So uh, you have a lot of autocratic regimes who learn from the Arab Spring that it's best that they controlled information so that the people can't, uh, can't have an uprising and, and overthrow the government. And in our nation, you have uh, really an information environment where there's just more information you can absorb. Uh, misinformation and disinformation is, is a challenge. And so the, my question is really, for the average American, what would you advise on how they can get to the truth of the information? Because it's really hard nowadays. And if I could, because this is leadership talk, the second one is, what advice would you give to a young second lieutenant such as yourself uh, when you were a lieutenant or a brand new member of Congress, some leadership advice you would give to yourself? Thank you, ma'am. Awesome, Scott, thank you. Um, you know, we have to work harder to gather information from different sources given the environment that we live in in order to draw our own conclusions. Uh, that, that's really the short answer to your question. Uh, no longer do we live in an environment where you can uh, you know, turn on the television and watch your favorite evening news channel and know that you will just be delivered uh, the facts. Uh, if you look at so much of corporate news and corporate media, it is, it is a for-profit driven industry. And so often there is a biased narrative uh, in, in the information that they are sharing. Uh, you look across social media, generally there's a bias in one direction or another. There are apps now that will tell you like, hey, this article and that article and that article leans left, leans right, straight down the center, just delivering the facts. And so there are tools that are available if you're interested in like, hey, is this news source uh, coming at me with a very specific political bias or not. And that can help filter some things out and uh, help you filter out where you get your information from. But really it comes down to us all having to work harder and be more discerning on, on the information uh, that we are, are receiving. The danger that I see happening in our country is this whole uh, you know, misinformation and disinformation thing is being weaponized to shut down voices uh, who ask tough questions, who maybe challenge um, a certain policy that's coming out of whether it's Congress or the White House or, or whatever it may be. Um, I think it's a really, really dangerous thing how quote unquote misinformation is being weaponized to shut down free speech. Ultimately, our leaders in government and in our society, frankly, those in power, and I include big tech in this because they are clearly choosing to be arbiters of whose voices are lifted and whose are, are suppressed, who is heard and who is not heard. Um, I've got a lot of personal experience with this, uh, even currently as we speak. Um, when the government says, hey, we're, you know, we're gonna shut this uh, information down or shut this voice down because we don't want you to be a recipient of misinformation. What they're really saying is we don't trust you, the listener, the viewer, the reader, 
to come to your own conclusions and to be able to analyze information from different sources yourself. That is an incredibly dangerous thing that moves us closer and closer to that authoritarian style of government control of information and away from uh, this democratic republic that, that celebrates uh, people's right to speak freely, to share their own opinions, and for each of us as individuals to say, hey, I, I think you're onto something, or say, you know what, I think you're completely crazy and, and, and you got nothing there. Um, I think this is, this is very, 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 very critical. And, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, you know, the, the advice, uh, gosh, I was thinking back when you say, think back to when I was a second lieutenant, man, there, there's, there's a lot of things that I wish I knew. Um, so that, that's a long list. I, I think most importantly is um, other than listen to and learn from your enlisted partner, um, it is really to never, ever, ever forget uh, who you work for. You know, there is a chain of command in place and, and a, a very specific rank structure in the military for a reason. Um, but never forget who you work for. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of specific experiences I've had where, you know, like in the army, for example, you have the army values, right, John, you've got loyalty and integrity. And, and I've just yeah. seen examples of people who um, forget who they're loyal to and end up making very poor and unethical decisions, thinking that they are being loyal to the quote unquote team or the boss. But, but in the course of that, actually... Uh, sacrificing their integrity and the well-being of those they've been charged to lead in the process. So, um, you know, I, I think having that ethical uh, foundation that's rooted again in servant leadership is is the most important thing. Awesome, Scott. Thanks for the question. Okay, Thank I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go to Sharon Mercer. Sharon, are you there? Uh, let's see, she's on. Uh, go ahead and unmute your microphone, Sharon. Okay, Victoria, does she need to unmute her microphone or do we have a problem? Yes, here? we've given her access. So Sharon, if you can just unmute yourself, then we can go ahead and have you answer. Okay, there you go. Sharon, oh, can you? Oh, 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 oh. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, Sharon, we've got some feedback. Oh, yeah. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have two devices on right now on the show? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, will yeah, get yeah. I think you need to shut one of them down, ma'am. Okay, can you come back to us now, unmute and come back to us? Um, she's still on, only one device is on now. Okay, Sharon, we're gonna come back to you. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Andrew Garate. Is that how we pronounce it, Andrew? If you're there, go ahead and ask your question, please. Yes, ma'am. Hey, ma'am. My hey, Andrew. Uh, uh, pleasure and honor to be able to talk with you tonight. Um, just had a real quick question. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge or threat that is facing our country right now, in your humble opinion? Thanks, thanks for your question, Andrew. Um, it is this erosion of and dismissal, outright rejection of our constitution by a lot of folks in power who have taken an oath to support and defend it. Uh, I, I won't repeat what I've said earlier, but, but that is very simply and very directly the greatest threat that I see to our democratic republic. Because once again, if, if we are uh, so willing to allow this foundation to be eroded, then we lose who we are um, 
as a country. We lose that North Star. We lose that um, uh, that 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 guiding light that exists to help us navigate through both domestic challenges as well as uh, you know foreign policy decisions and, and the decisions that our leaders make about uh, war and peace. Um, if if we don't if we the people don't hold our leaders accountable and uh, get back to this foundation, then um, I, I really, I, I am deeply, deeply concerned about uh, losing who we are as a country. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, Sharon, we're going to come back to you. Uh, you, you have access to unmute your microphone. The suspense is killing me, Sharon. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not going to forget about you, Sharon, but uh, uh, Herb Thompson, my good buddy Herb, um, go ahead and unmute and uh, let's hear what you have to say, brother. Hey, John Tulsi, thanks for having this conversation, first hey, off. Herb. Um, but hey, Tulsi, you've navigated the highest level of politics, the media, and let's be real, you, you, you be you, you stay yourself. And I think that's how I look at you. How, how do you stay true to yourself navigating through all that with a whole lot of negativity uh, coming your way? That's a really good question. Um, I love your profile picture, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like it looks like you're pretty true to yourself too, Herb. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, first and foremost, I mean, I, first and foremost is is I've always um, reminded myself and surrounded myself with people who also serve as reminders that it's not about me. Uh, you know, when I when I first ran for Congress. Uh, here in Hawaii back in, in 2012, um, you know, we put up these big posters and banners uh, uh, all over with my name on it, and my face on it. And I, I kid you not, for a very long time, every time I drove past one of those banners and saw my face, I physically had to turn away because I was so uncomfortable with, um, I was uncomfortable with it. Um, and over the years, I have, uh, I'm not at all attracted to the 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 so-called glitter and spotlight and and uh, you know placing on a pedestal that exists in our politics for those who are members of Congress or the U.S. Senate or whatever. Um, I, I've always been uncomfortable with all of that and not, and and not at all. I don't like it. Um, and where I am happiest always is when I'm with those who. Um, with those who I'm trying to, to serve. Uh, you know, my staff in DC, you know, would always know that um, if I was going, you know, I went back to Fort Jackson, for example, where I went to basic training and went back to the company uh, where I, you know, where I was assigned and, and went through basic training and got to hang out with the drill sergeants and with the, with the young soldiers there, we went to the range, got to shoot, man, like my mood just improved uh, completely. Um, similarly, getting out of DC and getting out to whether it's back to Hawaii or when I was campaigning and going and visiting different small towns and big cities across the country, actually spending time with the people that I was asking to serve. That was where I was happiest. That is where I'm happiest. And so whether it's kind of the day to day grind of, of politics and Washington and, and, and that swamp or it's all the crap on social media, whether it's like, oh my gosh, Tulsi, you're the greatest, or it's, oh my gosh, Tulsi, you're the worst human being that's ever existed on earth. Um, ultimately, I know that none of it's about, none of it's about me. And uh, it really is just about keeping that mission focus on my purpose. And my purpose is to serve in whatever way I can, whether that be in politics or the military or in any other way in life. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Herb. Okay, Sharon, here's your third try. Are you there? Uh, 
Uh, if you un if you can unmute yourself, we've given you permission to unmute yourself uh, within the Zoom here. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the question for Tulsi. Right. Uh, so I quote Sharon Mercer here, President Biden recently told soldiers they would be going into Ukraine. He also stated that Putin cannot remain in power. In both instances, his administration walked his comments back. What do you believe the administration's policies actually are with regards to the war and with Putin? Uh, well, look, I, I think that, that this effort towards regime change, I, I think President Biden just said out loud what has been said maybe quietly or not so quietly in the halls of Washington for years. This is not something new. And I think if we look back to, uh, we look back to 2016 with Hillary Clinton and, and her campaign and this focus on, uh, you know, uh, increasing tensions, bringing back a new Cold War between the United States and Russia, this, this has been building for quite some time. And so, Sadly, uh, I was not surprised to see uh, President Biden uh, make those comments. Um, I, I, I shouldn't assume that it goes without saying I, I disagree strongly. Our country should not be in the regime change business, uh, whether it be with Putin in Russia or, or in other countries. Our history is rife with far too many examples of the United States uh, leaders taking us into wars and, and trying to bring about regime change, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, but in both cases, uh, resulting in tremendous cost in lives and in treasure for the American people and our servicemen and women, uh, but also bringing about destruction and suffering uh, in other countries and, and death in, in other countries uh, around the world. We should not be the world's police. Um, we should not be in the regime change business. Uh, it actually undermines our national security and it, it undermines um, uh, our resources uh, uh, as a country. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Tulsi, I think you know on any of these shows, you always have that, if you remember the show Cheers and you remember yeah. Cliffy Clavin, the guy that always hung around, he was always at the bar. So the next guy asking a question is our Cliffy Clavin for Leader Talk, and his name is Edward Sullivan. So, uh, Cliffy, Edward, go ahead and unmute your mic and please ask uh, Tulsi a question. Uh, how's it going, ma'am? Ed Sullivan, aka Cliffy Clavin here. <laughs> <laughs> um, ma'am, one of the many issues that I feel leaders struggle with is communication and working past personal biases. For example, Somebody might ask something and people might interpret it a completely different way because they've got like some narrative in their head that wants to sway it a certain way. Mm. And how do you believe a leader should communicate effectively with those above and under them in order to make sure that whatever tasks assigned to that group are completed as they should be or whatever message that's being delivered to that group is interpreted as it should be in order to avoid like some kind of chaos. Yeah, that, that, is, that is an essential question, Ed, because com without communication, uh, we fail as leaders. Yeah. And um, uh, I, there's a few things I would say, I think, and I think, you know, communication of a message versus a communication of a task that you need completed, I think are maybe a little bit different, but both require knowing, knowing who you're talking to, first of all, yeah. and understanding where they are, um, you know, either what their level of understanding of a situation is, or, or just, just knowing your audience really is what it comes down to and crafting your message that you want to deliver to them in a way that uh, they'll understand it. I think that that's absolutely critical. And again, that goes with respecting, uh, respecting those who you're working with or those who you serve. Um, there was, uh, I, there, yeah, I, I've had a lot of, a lot of experience with this, um, over the years in being able to go and speak with people who come from a different place, who have a different background, who have a different perspective. And I found that what I was trying to convey was most effective when I, when I knew going in or, or got very quickly an understanding of who they were and where they were coming from. 
Um, you know, communication is a two-way street, right? So if you're communicating to your team, whether again, it's a vision or a message or a very specific task, you want to get that feedback. And being a leader who's willing to take that feedback, whether it's coming from somebody on the team who's like, hey, ma'am, um, what you're proposing is not a good idea. And here's why, and here's what the consequences of that might be. As a leader, you got to have the humility to be able to listen to that, take that, that direct feedback and either um, you know, adjust accordingly if there's validity to it, or to say, you know what? Nope, I've considered that. Here's the reason why we're sticking with this plan. Uh, but you've got to have, you've got to, you've got to be willing to, to uh, accept that uh, communication feedback as well. And then also, um, and this is something I just, I just try to do with my team all the time is if I'm setting an expectation or saying, here's something that needs to be completed, uh, having them give me that immediate back brief to make sure that what I'm communicating and thinking that they're hearing is, is that, is it actually what they're hearing uh, and interpreting and so um, I, I think those are, there, there are probably more, but I think those are, those are some of the most essential things that I've found in my experience. But, but your question is so important, Ed, because communication itself is a skill that takes work. And it is often, um, I think, undervalued. Uh, it's undervalued, whether it's through different training environments or, or just different situations. Uh, for leaders, and it, it is what I tell it is what I tell young people, whether those who are coming in the military or those who are going through college, um, you know, learn how to speak in front of people, uh, learn how to write, learn how to communicate whatever it is you are trying to convey, because if you're not able to do that effectively in any environment, whether you are in charge or you're a subordinate, um, you will fail. That is a certainty. Very well put. It's it's all about empathy and understanding in a lot Correct. of ways. Thanks a lot, ma'am. I appreciate you, Ed. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Cliffy. Um, let's go to Sylvie Ann Silvera. Are you there? Uh, giving you permission to answer live, you'll just need to unmute your microphone. Just did. Thank How are you, you doing? Hi, Good. Sylvie. Thanks for being here. Sure. So um, I just want to express my admiration for you guys. I was born and raised in Brazil. And over there, things are a little bit different. A little bit. <laughs> <Just say. laughs> but um, I'm learning so much from you. John, I start following you um, and, you know, reading your posts and the support you give to people. And I got to know your work, Tosi, through John. So I want to say thank you for that because I teach... Um, uh, English a second language and civics to refugees and immigrants here in Utah and sometimes they ask me questions that are like I have no idea how to answer that <laughs> and you know especially after this uh, this thing with Ukraine sometimes I feel like where can I get information to because there are uh, Utah Governor Cox he He's accepting a ton of immigrants and refugees and from Venezuela from from countries that are um, you know, going through all sorts of things. So where could I find things that are materials and, and podcasts and things like that to, to pass along? Because I'm teaching people things that I'm not sure if I know. <laughs> so where could I find that? I know, I know John had that, um, I think it's John and Ron show podcast mm -hmm. kind of a thing. So I got a lot of stuff from that. And if you, Tulsi, if you have some, some stuff to please, if you could just post your material here, I would be most grateful. I, United States is my, is my home now. I, I became a citizen in 2018. Nice. And uh, yes, and I just, I think it's not a question. It's more like a request. I, I really need some help here because they're, they're about uh, my first class with, you know, helping them to become, uh, to, to pass the naturalization process. I, I had 12 students and uh, they were like moms and dads, you know, and they are from all over the world. And they, out of those 12, 11 became citizens and they would send me the picture, swearing the flag. And I was all emotional and it was awesome. But yeah. I, I, we need to expand because Utah is receiving a lot of people. And I would like to do my little drop in the ocean 
you know, helping them to prepare and to also like, I love when you're answering that question, we need to, to trust ourselves with discernment. Yeah. And I think that's what I want to, to help them to say, hey, you can judge that. You can, you can learn and there, is, there are ways. So if you could just, just send me everything you have, I will be most grateful. And <laughs> the last thing is, John, do you know how did I get to know you as a person? This is a sad story. I was almost a scam. There are like lots of guys <laughs> pretending to be you. <laughs> and then, but I, I used to also work as a paralegal, you know, with immigration, preparing papers. And then I run an app. Dulce, you are right. There are so many apps today that you can use. And then it came up you. I didn't know you. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was almost scammed. But it turned out, you know, the silver line is I got to know your work and now I'm getting acquainted with Tulsi. So yeah, I just, I just admire you guys a lot for everything well, you have thank done. Thank you, Sylvie. You thank you yes. so much. So please send okay. your materials, okay? Thank you. Thank thank you. you. I'll, I'll share a few things with John. Um, I'll, I'll mention one recent one that I found uh, just recently called The Monk Debates. It's M-U-N-K Debates. They've got a podcast uh, as well as a website. Uh, they host uh, debates, uh, I think, quarterly. Um, it, it's really interesting because uh, in those debates, they're very civil, they're very, they're very fair and unbiased. I have found in the ones I've listened to, and they really, they really do present both views on a particular issue in a really thoughtful way. And, and I have found it helpful to be able to have that just in one place where you can hear leading voices on issues related to domestic policy or foreign policy, capitalism versus socialism, uh, you know, what's happening in Russia and with Ukraine, you, you get both of those different perspectives um, all, all in one, one go. And uh, I, I've, so, th so that's one uh, recent one that comes to mind. I've been listening to their podcast recently, but um, you, they're also, you, you can catch some of the, the live debates uh, uh, on YouTube. But I'll, I'll pass on a few other links uh, to John. And I'll just mention, Sylvie, since you're from Brazil, uh, to Dubeng. Uh, I spent many years as a youngster um, playing capoeira, Brazilian uh, martial arts. And uh, while I never, I have never yet made it to Brazil, it's, it's definitely on my short list. Um, I actually spent summers, again, as a teenager, taking uh, Brazilian Portuguese at a local um, uh, at a local school and, and uh, have learned and just there's a great Brazilian community here and, and I, I love I love the history and the culture so much so Thank Aloha you, Sylvie. <laughs> okay so let's go to big Dan Blaschel all the way from Alaska hey Dan uh, go ahead Dan unmute your mic Dan, uh, you'll have to unmute your mic. We've given you permission to unmute. Okay. Um, so his question, Tulsi, uh, Dan, I know very well. He's a retired Sar Sergeant Major uh, and uh, a close friend of mine. Uh, as a retired senior army leader, how do you reconcile the over, the over political politicization excuse me, of our military with the current administration that tries to divide us with social wokeness? Where do you draw the line as a leader? Um, you know, where, where do you draw the line, I think is, is, is maybe a little bit too vague of a question. Obviously our military should not be politicized. So if that's where the line is drawn, that's where the line is drawn. Regardless of what uh, party any administration has that's in place, uh, we, the American people, need to have faith that our military will not be used as a political tool or a weapon towards any means, whether they be domestic uh, or towards any objective, whether it be domestic uh, or foreign. I think that 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 is absolutely critical. Um, you know, it, it is very disturbing and disheartening to see um, our focus or, or the focus of a lot of our leaders in this country right now, including those in this administration, uh, being taken away from 
uh, ensuring that we have a tough, tested, uh, and ready military to confront the challenges uh, that we may face uh, to our country's security, uh, and instead seem to be focused on uh, on on uh, what do you call it the 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 conversations that are happening in our society uh, today. Uh, I've served now for 19 years. I hope to serve for many more. And, um, you know, the, the diversity within our ranks, uh, and, I, and I say diversity, not just in one respect, but, you know, political diversity, uh, you know, racial, religious, whatever the case may be, um, has always been there. It's always been there. And so rather than uh, implementing or, or, or trying to, um, you know, instate identity politics within our military, how about our leaders just focus on going back to the basics? You treat everyone with respect. Uh, yeah, you're going to face some harsh, harsh conditions. You might, you know, you're, you're, uh, battle buddy next to you might be somebody who's got a totally different view of the world than you and might be critical of your view. But guess what? That's life. That's life. I, I have, and John, I'd love to have an offline conversation with you about this because I've been hearing a lot of things, direct feedback from, uh, you know, cadre who are working at uh, some of our, our basic training institutions, not just in the army, but in different ones. For example, um, I went through some training recently where I was training alongside a lot of kids, young people who had just graduated from AIT and, and the kind of discipline and hardness and toughness uh, that is required of our servicemen and women. I have just, and this is anecdotal, but I've seen it, um, I've seen it uh, diminishing uh, again, because it comes down to priorities of leadership and I hold leaders completely responsible um, when we focus on, on the wrong things, um, my concern is we end up with, uh, with a force that is also focused on the wrong things. Um, you know, a, a, an NCO should be able to uh, create a disciplined environment for their team or their squad or their platoon um, without being worried about, you know, saying, hey, yeah, you were late to formation. I want 25 push-ups. Okay, cool. Make me stronger. Um, hey, whether it makes sense or not, I mean, like, I, again, I, I appreciate my enlisted experience because it made me a better officer. But um, if, if all we're worried about is offending uh, soldiers in the military, my gosh, like what in the world is going to happen when you have to go to combat? When you have to go to combat in another part of the world, uh, where you may be offended every freaking day. Um, this is a big topic. I'd love to freaking just let, let, let it rip. Uh, but I got a lot to say on it, but really, it really, it, it really just comes down to, um, you know, who do we, who do we want our military to be and how do we want them to execute in the harshest, toughest, most challenging environments that no civilian will ever, ever know or mm -hmm. understand how do we want them to affect uh, the desired impact in combat? Then we can build a military that will be able to accomplish that. Well, Tulsi, I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that conversation because uh, my thoughts are in line with yours. And uh, so we can do that. I'm gonna go to one last question and, uh, and then we're gonna have to uh, close out here. Kevin Miracle, are you there? Um, you've got the last question and please make it brief because we're almost out of time here. Yeah, can you hear me, John? I got you, brother, go ahead. Hey, see, so yeah, okay, Ms. Gabbard, uh, really appreciate you guys giving me just a quick second here. So uh, long story cut very short, I work for Veterans Lending Group. Uh, was wondering what you guys think about uh, the really most recommended number of people to lead within a group and still be effective as a leader. Uh, I really want to try to grow my team professionally, uh, but I don't want to grow too much as to uh, 
you know, not be that effective guy that, that leads my folks that, that I work around. So what is, what is not only a number, but kind of some, some methods that you know to, to lead a group smaller and larger? You want me to go first, John? Because I, I want to hear uh, I'm going to let you. This is about you, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. I'll let you answer that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I personally would love to hear your answer. But, but, to, sure. but uh, I, I'm not going to give you a number because, um, you know, there, there are doctrinal definitions that could give you that answer. I'm certain of it. But uh, I think it's important as a leader to be able to flex your leadership muscles regardless of how many people you may be responsible for. So, you know, obviously in the military, it's structured very smartly and very well to where, you know, if you're, if you're an E5, then you got four people who you're responsible for, right? As a squad leader uh, or, or a team leader. And then if you're, if you're a squad leader, there's, who are, who are you responsible for? Ultimately, you've got your two team leaders who you're responsible for, and then they lead those who they're responsible for. Same thing, platoon sergeant, who you, you got your four squad leaders that you're responsible for and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, whether it's in business or in the military, um, I think that uh, staying focused on your own structure of leadership uh, that allows you to keep a very close pulse on what is happening in your formation or in your company uh, is absolutely uh, critical. And also critical to that as your organization grows, um, You've got to make sure that you are empowering those leaders, subordinate leaders at every level are people who are going to be honest with you. I cannot highlight that enough because the higher you go up in that food chain, the more, you know, unfortunately, and this is, this is the sad thing, you know, from a leadership perspective is you're, you, you're no longer that, that for me, that platoon leader that's going out and in the field every day with the troops and you can hear them, you're talking to them, you're shooting the shit with them and you've got a pretty good pulse on what's going on. Company commander, as you go on, you know, staff officer, whatever, you, you just don't get those opportunities. So you've got to make sure that the people who you are able to kind of touch bases with on a daily basis or weekly or whatever it is, are people who are going to be honest with you and say, Hey, here's what's going, here's, here's what's really going on. Um, when, when you look at some of the failures in decisions that are made at the highest levels in our country and our government, um, Afghanistan, I think, is, is a great example. And I won't get into all the details, but I've seen, again, from personal experience, how you've got your, your uh, you know, um, uh, commander out, out on the ground at whatever level reporting up, hey, here's what's going on. Okay, they report it up one level, maybe it gets up another level without being tarnished. But then you start seeing again, those people who are more concerned about looking good and what their next review is going to be, rather than reporting the truth so that those making decisions at the highest level can, can uh, react accordingly, they start, well, actually, you know, well, I, I don't want, I don't want to pass this on because it might make someone look bad or it might make me look bad. And so you, you have what's happening actually on the ground as it goes higher and higher and higher you end up with a very sanitized um, report that very often we've seen is not at all an accurate picture of what's on the ground. And, and unfortunately, I think this happens a lot in the military. Uh, I've had friends, and I won't name names, but I've had friends in high ranking positions in the military who I'll have an offline conversation with. And then when they come before the committee and provide testimony, the things that they wanted to say have been red penned by somebody uh, so that they are delivering maybe a partial picture uh, rather than empowering policymakers and decision makers uh, with the full picture. So I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent a little bit here, uh, Kevin, but, but I think the bottom line is um, empowering leaders at every level to lead, trust them to lead and trust them and respect them to tell you the truth so that you as a leader are able to keep a strong pulse on what's happening and you can make the best decisions both for your organization and for those who you are leading and serving. Yeah, and I was just gonna add, Tulsi, um, the analogy you use with the team leader, squad leader, that kind of span of control and the team leader with four uh, soldiers underneath them. Um, I think, Kevin, that it, through a through your own kind of training and education or a 
a discipline training and education, some kind of certification process, you build trust and with trust you can empower. And I think uh, when you go through that and you practice the art of leadership and influence, you'll determine how much responsibility your subordinates should or could have. So um, Tulsi, unfortunately, boy, we could go on all night long here. I, I will tell you, um, again, from the entire team at Veterans Lending Group, our sponsor here, and you know, personally, thank you so much for being here today. I know how busy you are. I see it all the time. And that you took time to come down here and, and talk to these uh, service members, veterans and civilians or whatever, um, just shows how much you lead through your example. And, uh, you know, you are one of the most charismatic and visible leaders our nation has. You know, I might be a little biased, but, you know, um, so I got to ask, because not only this audience, but millions of Americans want to know, ma'am, what might we see from Lieutenant Colonel Tulsi Gabbard, the Honorable Tulsi Gabbard, or just the citizen Tulsi Gabbard in the future? What may we see and what should we be on the lookout for? And I'll give you the last word, ma'am. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. You're, you're incredibly, incredibly kind and generous with, with your words, John. Thank you. And I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I wish, I wish we all had the time to continue. I'm, I'm sure we'll have the chance to do this again. I hope we do. Um, Absolutely. It's been really, really fantastic. Um, I look, L Lieutenant Colonel Tulsi Gabbard, uh, my hope is that the Army will see it fit to allow me the privilege of serving in battalion command. Uh, I'll hope, uh, hopefully next year, um, I'll, I'll have that opportunity that that's my, my goal, uh, on that front. Uh, I'm going to go through, go through, I'm trying to get in shape, do, do a couple of army schools to kind of keep sharpening, uh, you know, my sword, um, you know, from, from on the civilian front, um, all, all I can say is, is I'm going to keep focusing on how I can best be of service uh, to our country. Um, you know, I, I'm not running for office right now. I don't have any immediate plans. Um, my goal is to best be of service and see where I can make the most impact. And, and we'll, we'll see where that leads. Awesome. Well, thanks again, ma'am. It's, it's been an honor. And, uh, you know, I look forward to talking to you again real soon. I would love to share uh, your thoughts that you were talking about, because this is something that I talk uh, a lot about here recently. So, and to our audience, thank you so much for being here today and to uh, spending time with Tulsi and I here today. And a uh, quick shout out. Thank you, Veterans Lending Group, our sponsor for putting this on. We'll see you all next month. My guest next month, someone that Tulsi I know knows real well, the author of the, the book Legacy about the New Zealand All Blacks, Mr. James Kerr will be my guest. So we look forward to having you on there. Tulsi, ma'am, thank you again, thank you. and have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. Have a great weekend, everybody.